Thanks for being here this morning. Um, so I get to continue uh, our series that we're doing this September called Heroes of the Faith. And um, back in May, I actually had the opportunity with my wife and my brother Tyler to go to Italy, which was really, really such an awesome experience. And when you go to Italy, you see a lot of churches, like tons of these beautiful, big old um, basilicas and stuff. And while I was there, I was really struck by all of these statues and sculptures and famous pieces of art depicting men and women from the Bible, from the New Testament, from the Old Testament. And it often presents them as these very uh, high and mighty figures, you know, like sword raised or, you know, on their knees in, in prayer with the light of heaven shining upon them. And, and all of these people mentioned throughout the Bible depicted over and over again really got me thinking about how much I feel we're very disconnected from these uh, men and women who really aren't meant to be held up as, you know, demigods or anything like that. They're just faithful servants who are in Scripture to teach us lessons. Um, And so I'm very excited about this series because I feel like we're going to get a chance to meet some of these people in the Old Testament who um, we can learn from and who we can glean a little bit from. Um, Now... If you don't know my wife, she loves lions. She just loves them. She has lion t-shirts, which she's wearing. She has lion coffee cups. She watches lion videos on YouTube. They're her favorite animal. She loves them to death. I've got lions up here for her. Um, And my name is Danny. So I'm very legitimately Daniel in the lion's den. And that's what we're going to speak about this morning. So... (laughs) I thought that lined up pretty well. Um, But I want to look at Daniel. I love Daniel. He's, um, scientifically, he has the best name of any character in the Bible. I I don't make up the truth. I just report it to you. Um, And I I love him. He's always been a favorite. No duh. I mean, when you're a kid and you meet the one Bible character who has your name, you're like, he's the best one. Um, But... When reading through the story of Daniel in the lion's den, I came to a realization that Daniel actually isn't that different from us. And like so many, like I mentioned, so many of these Old Testament figures are really held up. They're like, oh, they're so, so awesome, so great and powerful and so faithful. And really, the story of Daniel is one that I think we can all relate to. So turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. We're going to read the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Um, Daniel in your Bible is found right after the book of Ezekiel, so if you see Ezekiel, just keep walking. Um, And we're going to start right in verse 1 here. So Daniel chapter 6, verse 1, says this. It pleased Darius, this is the king, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. Daniel. The satraps were made according or accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Okay, three verses in and already I've contradicted myself because I'm claiming that Daniel is just like all of us and then the verse is like exceptional qualities. And if you're like me, you're like, well, I don't have those in great supply, maybe like two, and I keep them on the back burner for party tricks. And so let's explore Daniel a little bit more, because um, those exceptional qualities, I think, if we keep reading, we'll discover that they're actually not that exceptional, really, when you think about it. So in verse four, it says this, at this, this is the um, Daniel's being made second in command of the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to found, find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against the man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these great exceptional qualities that we're talking about here are that he's not negligent and he's not corrupt. Isn't it funny how just doing the right thing often shines out as being exceptional (laughs) in our world? Like negligence and corruption, you know, it's not something that we all wake up every morning and go like, I'm going to be corrupt today, just a little. It's a cheat day. Um, But really, Daniel is demonstrating here... uh, that he, he understands that truth that 
when we work for anyone, we work for God, right? As it says in Colossians, it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Now, obviously Daniel's Old Testament, but he still understands that no matter who he's serving, even a pagan king, he does it with all of his heart. He does it with righteousness because he recognizes that he's actually serving God. So we're going to look this morning at the choices of Daniel. Because like Daniel, we in life are presented with countless choices. And when I read through this story, it was, I was struck by actually how little Daniel is mentioned. Over the whole course of chapter 6, he doesn't come up very frequently. And when he does, it's in moments where he's presented with a choice, and then it tells us what he chose. So the first thing that he chose here is that he chose righteousness in his workplace. And all of this, like, exceptional qualities and everyone being jealous of him, it just boiled down to, given the choice between being negligent and corrupt or just working his hardest and doing it with excellence. He just chose excellence instead of choosing negligence or corruption. Now, negligence, of course, is that not paying attention, that cutting corners. It's something we are all tempted to do in our workplace all the time, and I say that with full knowledge that my boss is in the room. So (laughs) we'll do confession later. But corruption is the one that stands out to me too because... Corruption, I think we often, we often go to a very extreme place in our heads with corruption. We're like, oh, like $1,000 bribes under the table and, you know, like lobster dinners off the books and cheating on your taxes. But really, corruption is just any time that we compromise our integrity for some sort of reward. And this doesn't have to look like getting handed money at work for doing something that you shouldn't, although it can look like that depending on your line of work, but it can also look like trying to cozy up to your boss and compromising what you know to be right because you want to get the promotion. Or it can look like cheating a little bit on something here or there because, you know, like, it'll, it'll work out. It's just a little, it's just a little cheat. I'm just, I'm just helping. And it's corruption. It's not always big. It doesn't always start big. It can often end big. But what Daniel was choosing here is to say, I won't be corrupt, even if it's harder Even if it means I have to work more, I will choose to be integral in my job instead of taking the easy path to reward. And we got to remember, this is a time before social media. This is a time before internet. The king couldn't monitor him. There were no webcams. There were no security cameras. There was no paper trails. You know, they couldn't go online and look at his credit card statement to see if he was spending money that he shouldn't have been. It's all word of mouth in the Old Testament times. He could very easily have been corrupt. In fact, judging by the way all of his fellow co-workers reacted, I'll bet he's the only one who wasn't corrupt. Corruption was the currency of the day. You're working in the king's palace and you're not corrupt? Are you nuts? This is where you can get away with it. If ever there was a place for corruption and negligence, it's right here. You have all the power, none of the accountability, and all the money. That's like, that's corruption central. So he was being tempted into corruption, not just because he could benefit, but because everyone was doing it. It would have been very normal if this story reported to us that Daniel did a little corruption and everyone did a lot of corruption and Daniel went, well, I only did a little. That would not be, we would not look at him and be like, oh, sinner. We would be like, yeah, that's relatable. He chose none. He chose righteousness. He chose integrity in the face of great corruption. And we can make that same choice. All the choices that Daniel makes in this story, we can make the same choice because we're presented with the same choice. So when presented with the choice of whether he would take the easy road, the corrupt road, or the road of standing for righteousness, Daniel chose righteousness. Let's keep reading and see how this pays out for him. Verse 6. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. 
Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees, knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. So we've got this new law, thou shalt not pray to anyone but the king for 30 days. And Daniel goes home and he starts to pray to not the king for 30 days. This story I've heard presented in a very um, protesty sort of way. This idea that Daniel is this great uh, protester. Like he heard the law and he was like, well, forget that. I'm going to go home. I'm going to blow open my windows. I'm going to pray as loud as I'm going to shout down. I'm praying. What you going to do? And really, that, I mean, it's a fantastic visual, but it's not what the story's saying. And it's that last little bit, right at the end of verse 10, it says, and he prayed three times a day just as he had been doing. This choice, the second choice that Daniel makes here, is not the choice between protesting or allowing the law to corrupt him. The choice is between allowing his circumstances to change his faithfulness or not. Because Daniel, it says, had already been faithful. He had been a man of prayer before this law came into effect. And so when we read about Daniel starting to pray because of this law, he's not praying to fight the law. He's praying in spite of it. He is praying in spite of his circumstances, not because of his circumstances. I don't know if anyone else out there is like me, but I find, and this is bad and I'm confessing, I find that I pray so much more when I'm in times of crisis. And when those times that are easy and breezy in life come along, my prayer life starts to slip. And then another crisis, another hard, anxious time comes along and suddenly I'm back to, oh, full strength, turn the prayer up. And really, I'm playing a very dangerous game. And I think that there's probably others out there that can relate to that. But it's during the darkest times where, where suddenly we're all prayer warriors, but when the when the really nice, easy times come, that's like, why, you know, nothing, nothing pressing, God. I'll, I'll talk to you when something horrible comes along. But we're, we're actually gambling here. Because the same way that those crises can spur us to pray, I have seen so many people have those crises push them away from God. And really... The pattern that we should be following, the pattern that Daniel is demonstrating here is that we need to have a habit of discipline in our spiritual lives, a habit of prayer in the peace times so that when that fight comes, it's not, we're not going to wonder whether we're going to be able to pray up enough or, or get more disciplined in the hard time because we already did the groundwork in the easy time. And so when the hard time comes, our choice no longer has to be like, oh, can I change everything about my spiritual life that I've been neglecting for the past 10 months? It's just the choice of, can I remain faithful in this time? I've been faithful, and I'm going to choose to remain faithful. And that's the second choice that Daniel makes. He doesn't run to Facebook and start going, the king should be overthrown. Let's vote for someone else. He doesn't, you know, get all of his friends together and start whining about this new law. He doesn't go and change his prayer habits to go protest on the steps of the front. And he doesn't stop praying either. He doesn't let the law affect him one way or the other because Daniel understands something very simple. Laws come and go, governments come and go, kings come and go, but God and our relationship with him is eternal. And Daniel showed this habit of prayer every day. And so when this new law comes down, he goes, well, it's just another storm of life. Storms come in, storms go out. I'm still going to pray just as I have been doing. So the story continues. And I won't read all of the, the in-betweeny bits, but um, Daniel prays, which is against the law. And all the people who were waiting for him to pray, which is against the law, were like, look, he's praying. That's against the law. So they went to the king and they told the king. And the king was like, shoot, I really liked Daniel. And then the king goes, oh, well, can't do anything about that. So in verse 16, it says, the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel, and they threw him into the lion's den. By the way, this king just has a lion's den. Like, for them to, they didn't say, like, let's make this law and dig a lion's den. They were like, you know that lion's den you've had sitting around for a while? I know how we can use it. So <laughs> the king said to Daniel, 
may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. This is verse 16. Your God, who you, whom you serve continually, may he rescue you. So the king really liked Daniel, and he felt caught. And I don't have a lot of sympathy for him because, you know, he's a king, and he could do what he wants. But he's like, man, well, i got to throw this guy into the lion's den. I hope he survives. But what, the word that interests me there, because it's a word that keeps coming up in this chapter, is continually. It says that Daniel prayed continually. It says that Daniel, the, the king identifies, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. So this king, who's a pagan, is recognizing this in Daniel. He's seeing this in Daniel, that Daniel isn't a fair weather follower of God. Daniel serves his God continually, so much so that this king, who doesn't even really believe in God, is like, well, I hope he saves you because I've seen you serve him, so clearly something's there, and I, I don't want you to die, and I don't know what else to do. So I'm just saying, like, I hope your God rescues you, because clearly you know something I don't. Anyway, that's an aside. Let's continue into verse 19. So this is after a night of anxiety for the king who we're supposed to feel bad for, I think, because it tells us that he had no entertainment brought to him. None. <laughs> so that he's like, Daniel, you're in the lion's den, and I'm not going to watch Netflix. We're suffering together. <laughs> but first light, 19, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually, there it is again, been able to rescue you from the lions. Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done any wrong before you, your majesty. Now you might be thinking, there's not really a choice here on Daniel's part. Like, we understand that he chose to be righteous in his workplace. We understand that he chose to be faithful in his prayer life. But this part sounds a lot more like things that just happened to Daniel. Like, he's dragged, he's thrown into a lion's den, he's grabbed out of the lion's den in the morning, he's pulled out. God did a lot. Daniel didn't really have any choices here. But we're going to read one more verse. We're going to jump into verse 23, and we'll see. The king was overjoyed and gave orders for Daniel to be lifted out of the den and when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found in him, pay attention here, because he had trusted in his God. The Bible doesn't often say because. So when that word comes around, you pay attention. Because the Bible reports a lot of things that happened, but it doesn't always give us the why they happened. So when God chooses in his word to include the why, it's for a reason. And here we could say, well, Daniel was righteous, that's great. Daniel was faithful, that's great. And that clearly that's what got him through the lion's den. But there is a choice here because it says that Daniel wasn't touched by the lions. Why? Because he trusted in his God. So Daniel's third choice is that he chose hope in his darkest moment. Because he could have chosen righteousness before. And he could have chosen faithfulness in prayer and then been thrown into the lion's den and gone, God, I hate you. I, was, I chose righteousness. I chose faithfulness. You've abandoned me. These lions are going to eat me. But he doesn't. He chooses hope in that moment. He chooses to continue to trust God, even when it looks like everything that he's done has gone astray and that he may be, have made wrong choices all along. He knows that God promised him that those were right choices that not choosing corruption was the right choice, that not hiding his prayers away or stopping them was the right choice. And he knows that that was true so that in the lion's den, he chooses to hope in God and to trust him. Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame. This is not an isolated choice. None of our choices truly are. Daniel was not choosing hope in this moment in a vacuum. He was able to make this choice when everything seemed at its absolute blackest, like there was absolutely no hope. He's been thrown to hungry lions by the king of his whole country. And the reason that he was able to choose hope there is because he had chosen faithfulness 
because he had chosen right, righteousness, because he had a habit of making right choices that chose God every time instead of choosing the world. So when the darkest time comes, he was able to choose hope because perseverance produces character, character produces hope. It was because of Daniel's high character that he got into the lion's den in the first place, but it was also because of his high character that he was able to hope and trust in God throughout to bring him out the other side. Our choices, that's all that separates the heroes of the faith in the Old Testament from anyone else, is just a record of the crossroads in life that they came to and that they kept choosing God. And that same power is in all of our hands. None of us are lowly or lower or unable. None of us are barred from being heroes in this story that Jesus is writing. But what changes us from heroes to villains is whether we're willing to keep choosing God, to choose him in the easy times, to choose him in our workplace, to choose him in our prayer life, to choose him in the darkness. That's what it is the difference between being a hero of the faith or not. Because really, the story of Daniel, like I said, it's very relatable. It's just a story of someone who was living his life, doing his best for God, and you know, a situation came his way, something he didn't know how to deal with. It was completely out of his control. He enters into a very dark place, a place that looks possibly like it was his own making, but he knows that he keeps trusting his God, and at the end, God rescues him. That is, I mean, we've all been through that. We will all continue to go through that. That's the ups and downs of life. But Daniel is demonstrating for us, leaving a lesson in history for each of us to learn that when we choose God in righteousness, when we choose God in faithfulness, when we choose God in hope, he rescues. Because the real hero, the real protagonist of the story of Daniel isn't Daniel. It's not the king, and it's not the people who, if you wanted to read verse 25, get thrown to the lions and have all their bones crushed. The real hero is God, because he's always the real hero. He's always the main character. And it was the same God who, at the beginning, who blessed Daniel in his workplace for that righteousness. The same God who heard his prayers when the situation first came up is the same God who rescued him and shut the mouths of the lions. And it's the same God we serve today. Um, I know that there's many of us here who are on different parts of this path. That's the nature of church. There's some people here who you're like, yeah, I'm in the choose righteousness era. Things are going great. My life is looking up, but I'm being tempted by some things because things are going really well. There's some of us here who are in the choose faithfulness era. Things are starting to look shaky. Something's come up you don't know how to deal with. And all of a sudden, your prayer life is becoming more important. Will you choose to remain faithful or will you choose otherwise? And some of us are in the lion's den and are in that pit where the rock has been sealed over top and we've been tossed into a situation that from an earthly standpoint, there is no hope. But we can still in that darkest place choose to have hope and we can know as it promises in Romans that hope will never put us to shame. Let's pray. God, we just lift up all of those situations to you. First and foremost, God, we lift up those who are um, in a place where they feel that there is no hope. God, as we sung this morning, really was a prophetically uh, written worship set, God, that we would sing about choosing you and your protection over us. God, for those that are in the lion's den, we ask now that you would shut the mouths of the lions. God, that you would send hope where there is anxiety and fear. That you would send uh, a bolstering of faith where there is weakness and shaking of knees, God. That we would be able to look to you and know that when the first light of dawn comes, you will pull us from that den in Jesus' name. God, for those who are in a position where they are being tempted by corruption, by negligence, to choose other than righteousness, God, would you remind us that it is not our righteousness, but your righteousness that you gave to us through Jesus Christ. And that, God, we can choose the high road no matter how hard it is because we know that on that road you walk with us and on the road that looks easy we walk alone. So we choose to walk with you, Jesus. 
And God, for those who are in a place where they have to choose faithfulness, God, may we all be strengthened in our prayer life. May, may we recognize that when we cry out to you, you are the God who saves, you're the God who rescues, you're the God who hears us. God, may our prayers be answered. May our um, times of prayer be fruitful, God, and may we recognize the importance of prayer in all of our lives. You can keep your eyes closed, and um, I'll just ask the elders and uh, pastors if they would open their eyes just so I don't miss anyone. But if you're here this morning and you want to choose God for the first time, maybe you have never done that before, but you're saying, you know what, I do need hope in this time, and I need freedom from the things that have been weighing me down. Just by raising your hand, you can accept Jesus into your life. Is there anyone like that this morning? And God, we just lift up the rest of today to you, the rest of this week to you, God, and we just continue to make the right choices knowing that you guide us every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand? You're getting out a little early this morning. You're very welcome. That's my gift to you. Um, go be blessed. Thank you for being here.